Hello friends, happy Sabbath. I would like to welcome you with the words found in Psalm 60, 77 verse 11 that says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. The Sabbath day is a day to remember, a day to remember the works of God. And Secrets and Seal, Sam TV worship service has a very special program for you today. For our Sabbath school, we have uh, some special guests, some godly sisters that will be participating. Two of them are pastor's wives, and our other participant is our prison ministries director. And I am sure you will be blessed by that. And then our worship service is in charge of Pastor Bohr, our dear president, with the title Creation, Decreation, and Recreation. So don't miss it. Stay with us and do not forget to support your local churches with your tithes and offerings. God bless you. Lift every voice and sing with us hymn number 50, Abide With Me. Abide with me as was the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide, when other helpless, pale and comforts help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. Welcome to Sabbath School. We're so glad that you joined us and we hope that you'll be blessed this morning as we study a really important uh, theme, Jesus, the anchor for the soul. Now I'm joined this morning by two lovely ladies, uh, Joanna Mirage here. Uh, she is a, a pianist for school district and uh, also Kelly Miranda. And she is with our social media uh, department in Spanish, mostly in Spanish. And so we're so glad to have them with us today. And uh, we have a really good lesson. We're going to go through some uh, interesting turns, and we're going to 
end up on a very hopeful theme. And that is the, the anchor of the soul, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, Joanna, would you have opening prayer for us, please? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this Sabbath school, Lord, and this time to study your word. Lord, please be with us in our minds. Please send your Holy Spirit to guide us. Lord, and may we be blessed and may it bring you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this is a very interesting lesson. It's, it's, uh, we've been studying the priesthood of Christ. And now we take a little bit of a turn. It's a little bit of an interruption in Paul's teaching um, of, of the priesthood of Christ. And now he's writing kind of as a pastor to his flock giving them a warning. Now we have to really understand this warning. Um, uh, we wanna make sure that it's very clear who he's talking to. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be dissecting it a bit. And then he's going to encourage his flock after he gives this warning. And this is a little bit of a pattern that he follows. And um, we are gonna start in Hebrews 5 uh, verse 11. And we are gonna go th all the way through the sixth chapter of Hebrews. Um, now Kelly is going to read us our um, memory verse. And actually this is a spoiler alert because this takes us uh, to the end of the lesson. It's the very last two verses of our lesson of, our, of chapter six. But go ahead and read that for us, Kelly. Sure. I'm going to be reading from the New King James here in the quarterly. And it says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both secure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Thank you, Kelly. So, um, so what we see here, um, starting in uh, chapter 5, verse 11, is that um, Paul... I'm going to read this. He's, he's going to kind of describe where the church was at. And it wasn't in the best of shape. And so he was, he's going to give us a little bit of a warning um, that he was concerned. Um, as a pastor, he's concerned about his flock. Uh, there was uh, trials that they had gone through. Certainly there were persecutions in the new church. And there were stresses, of course, family, you know, rejecting those that had joined the new church. There were all kinds of issues that were going on. And we can think of our day, too. We, we, we're going through all kinds of trials, especially in the last couple of years. And so we need to see ourselves in this whole uh, scene of the church and the turmoil that it's going through. And so in um, verse 11, it says, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Mm. And so he describes uh, the church as dull of hearing, which is, is a concerning thing. And then he goes on to say, we're not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, then it goes on from verses 12 through the end of chapter 5, uh, 12 to 14. He's, he's saying that the church is really not progressing like it should. The new believers, these believers, actually they're not that new believers, but they were, uh, these believers were not progressing. They were not growing. They were still, he says they were still on the milk, um, on the basics. And they should be teachers by now, he said. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was this concern uh, that uh, they could fall away. And then um, we're going to jump into chapter six, which is where we're going to stay for the rest of the lesson. And um, we hope not to, to get soaked in the mire, but there is a lot um, to look at here. And we want to make sure it's understood because otherwise it may be discouraging. So um, let's see, Joanna, why don't you read um, chapter six, verses one through three? Okay, Hebrews six, one through three. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of re uh, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. So basically, so basically um, what, is, what is Paul saying here? What is Paul saying here? 
He's saying basically, let's not get stuck in the basics. He's he's saying um, we need to be moving forward in our growth in Christ. And if we have time, we'll talk about it. So he's talking about the baptism, doctrine of baptism, and he's talking about resurrection. Um, but he's saying he, want, he wants to go forward. Uh, and he knows that if the church doesn't go forward, if uh, the believers don't go forward, they're going to be, uh, they're going to, not only just get stuck where they're at, but they're going to fall away. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, we're going to spend some time in the next two verses here. Kelly, would you like to read uh, verses four through six? I'm reading from the King James Version, and it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. So this could be a little bit startling, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to hear him say, for it's impossible mm -hmm. for them to turn again um, if they, you know, it's, Put, they, they're putting the, the Son of God uh, to an open shame, putting him, uh, crucifying him again. And it's impossible for them to, to, to turn back. And a lot of people have, ha have been confused about this. And we are going to talk about that. But first, we want to see what were they like? Were they really converted Christians? Um, he describes them here. Uh, Kelly, what's the first thing that he's talking about? He says that for those who were once enlightened. Mm -hmm. And I think that enlightenment has to, to do a lot with the conversion that these people had mm -hmm. experienced. Mm -hmm. um, they had received light, uh, and here they are turning again unto darkness. Mm -hmm. And we know that Christ is the light of the world, and if we are enlightened, we have received that light which comes to us from Christ. Right. That's absolutely right. Um, that we, you know, we know there's contrast. The Bible contrasts light and darkness, like you said, uh, between God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. Um, in Acts 26, 18, um, when uh, this is part of Paul's commission to go to the Gentiles, um, he's told to turn their, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Uh, these clear contrasts. Um, and that was hit part of his commission. And of course, um, we know in First Peter two nine, this is very uh, a very common one. Uh, but ye are a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an unholy uh, nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Mm -hmm. And um, there are many many other um, uh, scriptures that talk about. Uh, the light and the darkness. And so uh, being enlightened, um, we see earlier, actually, we're going to be talking about Hebrews 10 in a little bit, but we, Hebrews 10, 30, uh, 26, it says that they receive the knowledge of the truth. So being enlightened, and, and then it says uh, in verse 32 that they were illuminated. So they had experienced conversion and they had understood the goodness of God. They had understood what the sacrifice of Christ made uh, was made on their behalf, and they understood the importance of it. Um, so enlightened. And, and what was the next characteristic that, that, that was described So after they were enlightened in verse 4? In verse 4, have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Okay. So, so tasted the heavenly gift. What, is, what does that mean? What does it mean when somebody tastes something? Do you, I think of Psalm 34. It's an experience. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. They've experienced it. So it, I think of Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the mm -hmm. Lord is good. Um, ex experiencing him for, for, for yourself. And also Hebrews 2, 9, it says, Jesus tasted death. So Paul uses this term, tasted, um, as having experienced it. But what about the heavenly gift? They tasted the heavenly gift. I feel like it has an intimate relationship to taste something. It's in, in you, in your mind, in your head, and you have a personal um, knowledge of whatever it is that has, has been tasted. So I feel like there's a special closeness uh, at that point of the Holy Ghost where not only do we have a 
understanding, but like a relationship. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Uh, right, not only the, the head knowledge, but also the heart and, uh, and a relationship. Um, I, I think, you know, I think of when we talk about gift, uh, Paul uses, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Mm -hmm. So they had tasted what eternal life, you know, the hope that it brings to your life, the peace. And so they had, these people had experienced that. And um, we're also going to look at the next phrase, which is, um, so they have, they had been enlightened, they had tasted the heavenly gift, and they had become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Um, so partakers, meaning they had participated, they had seen the working of the Holy Spirit. And earlier in Hebrews, it says God also bearing in two, two, four of Hebrews, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So they had seen the working of the Holy Spirit, right? In their own lives. Right. Yeah. Verse five, mm -hmm. uh, in chapter six of Hebrews mm -hmm. says, and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Mm -hmm. So they had witnessed um, some of those miracles and some of those powers. Right. So they had, so for instance, what are some of the miracles they might have seen or heard about? Uh, they saw people being healed. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. And even raised from the dead, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they had seen demons um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cast out. Mm -hmm. So they had seen these marvelous things. And um, the author of Hebrews also remembers another time when a group of Jews had come out, been delivered um, from Egypt, and they had also seen these marvelous mm -hmm. things. And the, the author of the, the quarterly, um, he says that it's possible that he was thinking about the, the um, leaving Egypt um, and when the Israelites came out and they had seen all these marvelous things, the departing, uh, the parting of the waters, they had seen, you know, they had been fed manna, their shoes hadn't worn out and all these amazing things, the pillar of cloud and the, and the pillar of fire. But yet when they came to the promised land, the edge of the promised land, they didn't go in because of unbelief. Yes. And th that probably was in the back of Paul's mind um, that you know, that he had seen this uh, dullness, uh, like mm -hmm. he says, uh, dull of hearing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so even though they had been, uh, we see that these people had truly been converted. They had tasted the good word of God. Mm -hmm. They had probably heard, they could have heard the, the good word of God from the Lord himself, right? Mm -hmm. um, but certainly they could have heard it secondhand from, from the disciples, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then it says, talking about the, they had experienced the powers of the age to come. Um, and um, we know, you know, that was uh, probably many miracles that they had seen. And so uh, they were in danger. And we're going to be talking in Monday's lesson about impossible to restore. And that <laughs> sounds pretty grave. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, to clarify, um, so... It says in verse six, if they fall away, um, it, so he says in verse four, it's impossible for those who are once enlightened and have gone through this conversion experience. If they fall away in verse six to renew them again to repentance, since this is, this is what they're doing. He says they crucify again for themselves, the son of God and put him to open shame. What does that mean? Crucify mm. him uh, again. This, any thoughts? Well, I would say that to crucify him again um, is to make of, of no avail mm -hmm. the sacrifice that he, he made for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's absolutely right. That's so they had, they had been resisting, you know, God's call. Um, they, they had been resisting the Holy Spirit. They had hardened their hearts. Mm -hmm. um, they had no remorse. So this isn't just like any, any, you know, people, a person that falls away. I mean, I can tell you, I fell away in my walk. And uh, I remember the time when I had a box of um, Christian books, the red books in my garage. I was ready to sell them. And um, thank God he brought me back. He knew I still um, had a piece of my heart that was open to him. So God brought me back through a series of trials. And I thank him for those trials because mm -hmm. I needed him so bad. So um, this is not just talking about, you know, falling away um, for a short time, but this is talking about people were, who had no remorse, they had no desire uh, to turn from sin. Mm -hmm. And um, they, 
they basically divorce themselves from God. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you that have been through a divorce, you know when the other person walks away, they, you know, they cut off ties and they leave mm -hmm. and they align themselves with, with someone else. And so these people had divorced themselves mm -hmm. from God. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so it's not that it was impossible for God um, that he didn't want, <laughs> want their hearts. Of course, right. he, uh, Jesus came to die for everyone. Um, but um, they had totally... Uh, totally turned away. Um, do we have any examples of people that, um, in, maybe in the Bible, that um, uh, fell away but they came back? Do we have? Do we? Can we think of anybody? Well, before we get there, sure. there's something that comes to my mind whenever we talk about this uh, crucifying of Christ, because as you said, it's mm. it's something we do ourselves right. to him. I mean, we weren't there personally mm. uh, when Christ was crucified. Mm. We didn't partake of that crucifixion. But every time we, we sin and we partake mm. of our indulgence of sin, uh, we are ourselves crucifying Christ. And that tells us uh, about our relationship with him. When we separate ourselves from him, like you said, uh, referring to a divorce, uh, and, and separating and joining ourselves to another. Um, it's a very personal experience that, that we are having in that crucifixion. Mm. And uh, falling away is very dangerous because whenever we do so, we have separated ourselves from Him. And that means that it's not that, like you said, it's not impossible for God, mm. uh, but God allows us to have our free will. Mm. And with that free will, um, like Jesus says, you know, there, there's no one who can take us out of his hand, but we ourselves can leave. And so it's not impossible because it's impossible for God. Right. But it's out of God's hands. It's in our responsibility. That's right. And, and the call to Christianity, um, we find, um, you know, is, is, is to take up our cross, deny ourselves and follow him. Right. And dying actually crucifying self is a, is a concept that's uh, uh, that we read over and over in the in the bible um jesus said to his disciples in 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 matthew 16 24 you know if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross in other words crucify himself and follow me um joanna why don't you read for us in um in the quarterly on page 87 um, oh, there, the okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're in the paragraph impossible to restore. Um, it's, Which what, day? it's on Monday. So we're talking about, um, crucifying self, you know, in Galatians 2.20 is one of, probably one of the, the, the most, um, commonly heard. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So this concept of crucifying ourselves is biblical. Go ahead and read, starting where it says, when the religious leaders. When the religious leaders crucified Jesus, they did it because Jesus posed a threat to their supremacy and autonomy. Thus, they hoped to eliminate Jesus as a person and destroy a powerful and dangerous enemy. Similarly, the gospel challenges, is, challenges the sovereignty and self-determination of the individual at the most fundamental level. The essence of Christian life is to take up the cross and deny oneself, Matthew 16, 24. This means to crucify the world, Galatians 6, 14, the old man and the flesh with its passions and desires, Galatians 5, 24. The purpose of the Christian life is that we undergo a kind of, of death. There, you can stop there. So, so just reiterating that the purpose of the Christian life is that we undergo a kind of death. Now, so he's describing a people that are putting Christ to death again. So rather mm. than putting self to death, mm. um, they're, put, they're, they're crucifying Christ again by rejecting him. Mm. And um, that's, um, that, that prevents them from being able to hear uh, the voice of God. Um, and in fact, I, I was thinking of, um, this, is, this is kind of like the unpardonable sin, which is, uh, which is found in Matthew 12. Um, it's very much like that. Um, and I, I like the description of the Bible commentary um, 
that says progressive resistance to truth that culminates in a mm. final and irrevocable decision mm. um, against it, deliberately made in the full knowledge that by doing so is choosing to pursue his own course of action in opposition to the divine will. So um, this is something that was done in heaven, wasn't it? Mm. For sure. Done by Lucifer. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, Desire of Ages describes it perfectly. She says Lucifer in heaven had sinned in the light of mm -hmm. God's glory. He was there full, in full <laughs> face. He could see God's glory. Mm -hmm. To him, as to no other created being, was given a revelation of God's love. Understanding the character of God, knowing his goodness, mm -hmm. Satan chose mm -hmm. to follow his own selfish, independent will. And then this is, this is crucial what she says. This choice was final. Mm. There was no more that God could do to save him. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah you've gotten into the, the gist of Tuesday's lesson, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the impartable sin. Yeah. And it's interesting there that it talks about three aspects of, of that sin. Mm. And, you know, uh, this is jumping forward to... Hebrews chapter 10, and maybe it would be good to read those verses. Yeah, so Hebrews, um, we, we're mostly going to stay in Hebrews chapter 6, but Hebrews t uh, 10 uh, kind of repeats a very similar warning and encouragement. So um, would you like to read that, uh, Joanna, Hebrews 10, 26, how about 26 to 29? Mm -hmm. Okay, Hebrews 10. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. So we see here described uh, described similar uh, characteristics mm. um, that they had trampled the Son of God underfoot. What does that mean? Mm. Um, I would say that <laughs> that has to do with rejecting mm. Christ, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rejecting what He's done, and and showing a little bit of hatred for Him. Yeah. And place self mm -hmm. over Christ. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an imagery of placing Christ in submission. Mercy. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's almost hard to yeah. say. Mm. Uh, and defeat. Um, you know, Hebrews 1.13, when uh, God says uh, to, to Christ, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The enemy, mm. the place of the enemy is at the foot. Uh, so these people had um, exalted self. Now, what do we think of what... What, uh, what do we, I think of Isaiah 14, where Satan says, I will exalt my throne mm -hmm. uh, above the stars of, the, of God. I'm going to ascend above the heights of, of the clouds. This is, this is an attitude where, of self-exaltation. And uh, that's uh, what, what we can describe as uh, trampling the son of God underfoot. And then it says he, they counted the blood of the covenant by which uh, he was sanctified a common thing. So mm -hmm. what, uh, what does that mean? Well, we're uh, rejecting. That's we're right. rejecting the sacrifice of Christ right. and what he's done for us whenever we profane his blood. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, um, so these, these folks were, this is kind of describing the same, you know, it's a fearful thing um, that the, these people, it says, for if we sin willfully, there remains no more sacrifice for sin because they've rejected it. It's not because it, it wasn't available. It's because they rejected it. Um, but I was, um, I had mentioned that we see in the Bible, there are many ep uh, examples of people that turn back to God, aren't there? Mm. A prodigal son, maybe? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's probably one of the ones foremost in my mind. What about David? Um, mm -hmm. We see David, and in, in, in Psalm 51, you know, he says, 
um, restore to me, you know, the joy uh, of your salvation, create in me a clean heart. And we know, of course, David re was restored to God, right? Yeah. You know, so the, uh, we absolutely know I've, if we believe 1 John 1, 9, oh, yeah. if we confess our faithful sins, just, right, he's absolutely just faithful. Just so we don't have to fear um, as long as we're not in a, in a hardened position um, and closing off uh, communication with God. You know, I was thinking about um, how God communicates to us through the Holy Spirit, right? And uh, I don't know, do you guys get robocalls? Robocalls. <laughs> robocalls on your telephone? Um, you know, we get, a, I get a lot of robocalls, these uh, calls that oh, are that people that I don't, I don't even know who they are and I don't answer them. Mm. Uh, but uh, what I do is I block the caller. Every time I get one, mm -hmm. I go in uh, and I block that call. And these people had blocked God. They mm. had blocked the Holy Spirit. Excellent. So mm. the, uh, the, God was not a, uh, able mm. to even yeah. uh, communicate with them anymore. Mm. So let's move on uh, in chapter six to something better. <laughs> Um, and um, let's see, Joanna, why don't you read, um, let's start, we're going to skip over verses 7 and 8 and go ahead and go to uh, verse 9 and we can read um, through verse 12. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have shown towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Kind of nice, nice uh, to your ears now, right? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little oh. bit of soothing, <laughs> uh, soothing words here. Um, that, and so we're talking about, um, you know, kind of affirmation, if you want to call it, uh, affirmation uh, that the saints mm -hmm. were doing good things. And Paul uh, could see that, that they were, uh, God, you know, was going to bless them for that. And um, uh, we know that uh, treating others in the church and doing good works uh, is, is evidence of God's love, right? Amen. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what scriptures, can you think of any scriptures that might support that? Well, Definitely. before we sure. get there, I mm -hmm. was thinking about how important uh, those first verses of chapter mm. 6 and those verses of chapter 10 were. Mm. Uh, because if all we hear are, you know, uh, words of... Censure. Of of encouragement and everything, oh, uh, mm. we're not going to grow. We think that we are good mm. and that we're safe and that we're already on the top uh, and that we have no need to, to fear or to be on guard. Right, right. Uh, so that part of th that admonition that he made uh, was, was very important uh, for uh, the Hebrews. And I, I like that he transitions with these words of encouragement saying, you know, um, I, I have every high hope that you're going to continue strong, that you're going to heed uh, this admonition that I've given to you and you're going to follow through with the good works which you've already been doing right. and you're going to keep on doing them. And mm -hmm. so I think that is, is very important even with ourselves in our daily lives. Uh, we need to grow and we need not fear, um, correct others, mm -hmm. uh, but we should all also encourage them and recognize the good that they do as well. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, I was thinking of um, Revelation uh, 3, where it says um, in verse uh, 19, as many as I love, I rebuke mm -hmm. and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So uh, this rebuke is biblical mm -hmm. um, and it was, it's a warning of a, of a loving uh, shepherd to his sheep. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but it, it was stern um, and it, it, obviously they were doing things that were, um, he could see that, that were leading them to self-destruct. Yeah. I love that we have a special light to of the process of sanctification where we're reminded that it's a daily process and everybody is progressing. Right. Nobody has reached an end point right. and it, this um, continuation will continue in heaven. That's where right. the growth just continues. Yeah, that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. That's encouraging. Absolutely. 
So here he, he just, uh, at the, at, in verse 12, he warns them, not, don't become sluggish. Mm -hmm. That's kind of reminiscent of dull of hearing. Um, don't, you know, don't, uh, don't become sluggish, uh, but continue, as you said, mm -hmm. in doing those good works, um, because we know that good works are evidence. Um, uh, John 13, 34 and 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another by this all will know that you are my disciples mm -hmm. if you love one another. Right. And we have those mm -hmm. examples, uh, like you were asking, mm -hmm. uh, about Dorcas and the others, how mm -hmm. um, they were so concerned uh, about the, the needs of others. Um, the church was very united, we know, um, and there was a lot of giving and, and a lot of care for the widows, for the orphans, and we know that they were performing these kinds of works. Right. That's right. Okay, so, um, and then, you know, the next section, uh, verses 13 um, through 18. Do you want to read that section then, Kelly? Yes. So, verse 13 says, For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing will I bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Through 16, you said? Or? Uh, you can, um, we can, actually, we can just stop there for a minute. Um, so what, it, what is he saying about Abraham? What, he's using him as an example, right? Mm -hmm. Of somebody who had endured um, and he had believed the promise and um, we're going to talk about these oaths, how important they were. But he had believed. And in fact, we see in Hebrews 11, um, a, a whole list of men and women of God uh, that had also endured to the end and been faithful, culminating in what in chapter 12, mm -hmm. in Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it culminating in the true you know, prince of peace that, that came to this world yeah. and um, he lived the life that, uh, that we should have lived, but he lived it for us. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so he introduces Abraham and, and patiently enduring. We know that patience is something that the saints are going to have, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do we develop patience? Mm. <laughs> With trials. That's right. That's right. I can think of many, many trials in my life. Um, and um, having gone through them, I see that God has grown me. Amen. That's been my experience. And I'm, and I'm not saying I would choose, <laughs> choose um, trials, but uh, I know that God has my best um, interest in, in mind when he allows me to go through the fire. So, um, so patience of the saints, that take, that's taken from Revelation uh, 14, 12. We know that God's end time people, we have a lot of things that are going to be coming up. We know right now we're in the middle of a pandemic and um, this has caused us to grow, I think, all of us. For sure. Uh, we've, um, our, our faith has, has been strengthened, um, hopefully, um, through these trials. And these, uh, these are small compared to what we know are um, mm -hmm. the trials that are going to come ahead. So um, let us not grow, grow a weary in well-doing um, while we are on this road um, as, as strangers and pilgrims. Right. So, any other comments before we move forward to, to the Jesus, the anchor of the soul? Let's see, we're going to look at verses. We're going to then read, um, if you'd like to read, Joanna, um, we're going to start. Uh, so, we talked about uh, Abraham, um, verses 16 through 18. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what about this oath, mm. Kelly? Do you have uh, any thoughts on that? Well, we know that um, an oath, oath is uh, a promise to us, 
and God guaranteed his promise with an oath. Uh, that's why we have the old covenant and the new covenant, which was fulfilled with Christ. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, the Lord has given us many, many promises in his word. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this oath, uh, really uh, the ultimate oath that we have, that we cling to is that of eternal life, which mm. we receive through Christ. Beautiful. Okay, so so God guarantees us. So we're, we're, we know because of two things mm -hmm. that God has guaranteed our salvation. And one of them is that he has given an oath. He gave that oath to Abraham and to David, and it was, it was uh, fulfilled in Christ. Um, and um, God doesn't ever go, can't go back on his oath. Um, in fact, it says in, um, the Romans eleven twenty nine 29 is one verse, but it says for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. When God says something, it's true and it's going to happen. Mm. Um, we don't have to doubt that. Um, and so that's one way we know, uh, we can be sure, um, that, uh, we have a, we have, of course we have an anchor, um, which is Jesus. So but because of the ascension of Christ, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, sitting at the right hand of God, he was our first fruit. Right. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was the first fruit. Um, and so because uh, God accepted his sacrifice in our behalf, we have every hope uh, that we, too, um, will be in heaven and um, be resurrected. So these uh, these two things are very important, uh, that these two guarantees um, and by Jesus sitting at the right hand and by these oaths that he made. Um, so his, his ascension uh, makes our salvation certain. Amen. And so. And can I say, I, sure, I yes. love the language that is used here. Mm -hmm. We use the heirs, uh -huh. oath, right. forerunner. Mm -hmm. These all um, support the fact that we will be recipients, not random recipients, mm -hmm. but children of our, uh, of of our God. God and of our Savior. And it just makes it that much more intimate and personal right. when we read the word and, and take it, you know, each word as specifically as it has been uh, set before us. Right. Love it. When we pray, every time you open the word, we need to pray for mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, right? Because mm -hmm. we really can't understand spiritual things without the, the Holy Spirit living in us and, and uh, bringing to, to us the understanding because our, our minds are dark and they've been tainted by sin. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but God can pierce through that darkness. I always Amen. ask him, God, can Amen. you pierce through the darkness of my mind mm -hmm. and uh, teach me what is true and show me your will for my life? And... Uh, but we have this incredible hope, which, uh, which is, uh, he uses the metaphor uh, of an anchor mm -hmm. of the soul, uh, both sure and steadfast. This is uh, um, really, uh, this is just really strong language um, and uh, which enters the presence behind the veil where mm -hmm. the forerunner uh, has entered for us, even Jesus. And this is kind of a nautical nautical kind of a theme, right? An anchor. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you think of the anchor, you know, holding us through the storms of life. I was thinking of um, that story um, when Jesus had fed the 5,000 and uh, they were, uh, he had uh, sent his disciples on a boat. This is, this is found in actually Mark, Mark 6. And uh, uh, Jesus went, went by himself and he sent his disciples on the water and the scripture tells us that um, as they were in their boat, the, the, the storms came and they were very afraid. And I would have been afraid too. I don't really like water that much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and the master wasn't with them and um, they were fearful for their life. And then they see Jesus coming mm -hmm. in the night and they didn't first, they thought it was a ghost. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but Jesus... Um, I love what he says. He, sa he says three things that I just absolutely love. He mm -hmm. says, he says, be of good cheer. And why are we, why should we be of good cheer? He says, it is I, mm. be not afraid. Yes. And um, this is such an encouragement to us because we believe we're living in the, the, the last days of this earth's history. Um, we believe that um, um, perilous times are, are coming. And um, if we're not progressing in our spiritual walk, mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, if we're not growing, if we're not reading the word, spending time in prayer, sharing our faith with others, um, we are not going to, uh, we're going to get discouraged and uh, we're going to be like, uh, like he says, uh, we're going to be uh, dull of hearing and we're going to be uh, shutting off the Holy Spirit. And uh, the world has great attraction and mm. uh, it has an influence on us, right? For sure. Uh, it has For an, sure. we're, we're, we live in the world mm -hmm. and we're influenced by um, the, the world and it, it, it impacts our lives. And we have loved ones that are not, mm. um, that are not uh, in the faith. And mm. so um, w to be strong mm. uh, in the midst of these things that pull us, that the trials, um, you know, Personally, this 2022 started out with quite a bang. And for me, a lot of my family had COVID and including myself. And uh, we went through a lot. One sister was hospitalized. So, uh, so there's all kinds of um, trials that uh, the waves that, that, that come against us. But when, when we know we have an anchor, um, um, then um, how, how does that affect yeah. your life? Does that affect your life? I love it. Like it says, it, it brings exactly here what it says in the Bible, which hope mm. we have as an anchor mm. of the soul. And right. it reminds me that it's our nature as fallen um, humanity to, to waver and to let the waves push us left and right and every which way. But when we hold on to our hope, in uh, the anchor of the soul, of our soul, that will keep us sure and steadfast. That, that is um, a promise that I want to remember. And I appreciate uh, this reading, this uh, study for, for this week, because like she, Sister said, during COVID, everybody has waves bringing them right. everywhere. And in, in some may be huge, some may be tiny. Mm. And, um, but when we have, all we need is God as our anchor, right. and it's the assurance that we need to get us through these times. That's mm -hmm. right. Jeez. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And I think that all of this chapter has to teach us, uh, a, this lesson, sorry, um, is about our relationship with God and our need to be firmly uh, clinging to that anchor. Yeah. Uh, we need to have our anchor anchored in Christ. Christ yeah. is our anchor. And um, on Friday, it talks a, a little bit about John mm. and how he just had this deep love for Christ. Mm. And really, uh, it has a comparison there uh, talking about, about him and Judas and things. But um, it was his deep mm. love, it says here, yeah. which led him always to desire to be close by his side. And so really we have to uh, work on our relationship with Christ right. mm -hmm. and only by doing such will our love grow and will we want to remain by That's his right. side. That's right. right. Because you're not going to uh, bay out of fear. You're not going to be following Christ out of fear. We, we know that people fall away if they, if they're, if they're um, not anchored into his love, like you said. And uh, it is only when you fall in love with Christ, when you develop that relationship with him, just like a husband and wife, you spend time together mm -hmm. and your, your love grows over time. And um, so that's, uh, I'm gonna read, go ahead and read the last um, part of that, that what you were talking about. This is from Acts of the Apostles uh, about John. You said the savior loved all the 12, but John's was the most receptive spirit. Um, he was younger than the others and with, um, and with more of the child's, child's confiding trust, he opened his heart to Jesus. Thus he became, came into more sympathy with Christ and through him, the Savior's deepest spiritual teaching was communicated to the people. Um, so we, we, we hear these warnings. We, um, and today we talked a little bit about these warnings. We have nothing to fear. Isaiah 55 uh, verses six and seven says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him <laughs> and to God for he will abundantly pardon. God wants us yeah. to come to him. When we've, when we've sinned, um, when we've fallen away, we've been tempted. Um, God wants us to come there. He's like um, the... Uh, the parable uh, of the, the the son that went away, the prodigal son, and he's there with open arms. He wants us to return to him. He loves us, and he will forgive us. So, um, so let's remember these things. Let's 
let's let's take heart, let's be strong, let's encourage one another in the faith. And uh, we're so glad that you joined us this morning. We hope that you've been encouraged by this lesson. We hope you go home and read it a little bit more. And uh, God bless you all. Thank you so much. Well, we've had a wonderful Sabbath school study this morning. And now before we enter the worship service, we want to ask the Lord's special presence as we study His Word and sing His praises. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne in the powerful name of Jesus, asking that you will bless this worship service program, that your name might be honored and glorified and that our lives might be edified for your honor and glory. We thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God marks his own. That's the name of today's Bible story. Have you ever divided a bag of candy among a group of friends? And if so, you pass it out, you say, one for you, one for you, and one for you, and one for me. Now, once you divide them equally, then you mark your own bag. Well, in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation of John, it tells us that God is going to do some marking too. Just before Jesus returns to glory, in glory, he will send a mighty angel all around the world to seal his servants of God on their foreheads. Of course, this doesn't mean that he's going to put a tattoo on your, anybody's head. Of course not. That wouldn't mean a thing. Rather, he will do something in the minds and in the hearts of young men and women and boys and girls and everybody that, and that will be seen in the holy joy in their faces and in the goodness of their lives. By these, everybody will know that they belong to God and God will know it too. Now, as to how this sealing will be done, nothing is said here, but Paul made it clear to the Ephesians when he said that they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise in Ephesians 1.13. This is how God marks his own, just as the Holy Spirit leads people to be born again, so he brings them step by step into perfect oneness in, with him. Can anyone know he is sealed? The only way is to be sure is to give him yourself entirely to God, praying for strength day by day, to live in full obedience to his will. This means that you will ever try to live a pure, clean, beautiful life that you know he wants you to live. It, you do it by surrendering to God every day. You do it by asking for the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, and asking for his armor daily. It means that you will be, seek to keep his commandments, all 10 of them. It means that you will put no other gods above him, our God, and you will never bow down to an idol of any kind. You will never take his name in vain, of course not. And you will keep his true Sabbath as a holy day. And you will honor your father and your mother and you will never kill, you will never commit adultery or steal or lie or covet your neighbor's goods. In other words, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength and your neighbor as yourself. This means that your heart will be filled to overflowing with the love of God. Thus, in the very last day of earth's history, when God searches among all the nations for his remnant people like you and your home and everyone in your home, he will look for those who are so full of love and that they have become a perfect reflection of himself. 
Not only do they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, but their lives will have become beautified with the love for God and men. To these, God will say, you are mine and you and you and you and they, they shall be mine, he says, in that day when I make up my special treasure in Malachi 3.17, it says, will you be among the happy company? Will you let God mark you as his own? Will you let him seal you for his kingdom? You can see here the children that are brought, that are sealed and coming to get their crown and God is giving him their crown. See how Jesus is giving each child their crown? You too can get your crown and you too can be sealed just by living for him and loving him with all your heart and mind and soul. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word.
Some TV is a worldwide Christian ministry providing Christ-centered programs with clarity and power on topics such as Bible prophecy, end-time events, Bible interpretation, tips for healthful living, cooking demonstrations, and much more. Our programs provide practical counsel for daily life and assurance in these uncertain times. Download the free Some TV app or watch online at sumtv.org. You will be blessed. Well, greetings, everyone. Today, the title of our study is Creation, Decreation, and Recreation. But before we begin our study, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before your throne in humility, realizing that our knowledge is so limited. We ask that you will enlighten us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to feel that strong desire that this world will come to an end, Jesus will come, and we'll be able to live in that land where there will be no more suffering, sorrow, depression, sin, and death. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At creation, this planet had four problems. Let's read Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Before God began the events of creation week, this earth had four specific problems. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. Here's the first problem, without form. That means in a disorderly state. And void... Second problem, that means empty. And darkness, there's a third problem. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. There's a fourth uh, problem that is not mentioned in these verses, but in the succeeding verses we find it. And that is that there was no life on planet Earth. So four problems. The planet was in a disorderly state. It was empty. It was in darkness, and there was no life. Now the question is, was the planet already here when creation week started? Some think yes, and others think no. The expression heavens and earth, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, which is repeated in the fourth commandment, seems to indicate that God made the heavens and the earth during the first six days of creation week. You say, how do we know that? Well, you'll notice that Genesis 1, 1 and 2 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Notice Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, very similar terminology. It says there, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rest of the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So notice that the creation account says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The fourth commandment says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. So it seems like God created this planet and immediately began the process that is described concerning the first six days and then the seventh day of the events of creation week. So after creating this planet, God undertook to solve the four problems that the planet had. First, he had to put the planet in order. Secondly, he had to fill it. Third, he had to enlighten the planet. And finally, he had to create life. So let's review what God did during creation week. The first day we're told that God created the light, which began the cycle of day and night. The second day God created the firmament, or the atmosphere, the air that we breathe. The third day God created the vegetation on this planet. The fourth day he took the sun, moon, and stars and placed them in order in the cosmos. 
On the fifth day God made the marine creatures. The sixth day God made the airborne creatures. The sixth day God made the airborne creatures, and then on the sixth day God made the land animals. And after making the land animals, He created man and then woman, and finally God created or made the Sabbath. Yes, the Sabbath is part of creation. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. So the Sabbath was something that God made along with everything else during the week. God made sacred time. If you wonder about that word made, where it has, whether it has to do with creation, it's the same word that's used in John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3 and then again in verse 10 where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it says, in verse 3, all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In other words, the word made there uh, clearly describes something that God created during creation week. And Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. Now who was the creator during the six days of the actual work and the seventh day of rest. The Bible is very clear that the Father created everything through the instrumentality of the Son. In other words, the Father was the architect, He came up with the plan, and Jesus implemented the plan. Jesus was, so to speak, the master builder. Let's read some verses to that effect. Go with me to John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 which I just referred to a short while ago. It says there, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is Jesus because verse 14 says the Word was made flesh. Verse uh, 2, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, that is through the Word, and without Him nothing was made that was made. The word through there is the preposition dia in Greek, and it means through, through the instrumentality of. Notice also 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6. Here, once again, we find clearly that the Father and the Son were both involved in creation. The Father devised the plan, Jesus implemented the plan. It says there, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11 once again refers to creation as a work of the Father. It's, implement, it's done by the will of the Father. The Father devises the plan, and the Son implements the plan. Let's read Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11 where it says, This is a group in heaven, the 24 elders and the four living creatures. They're praising the Lord, and they say, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. Now the one sitting on the throne whom they are worshiping is God the Father. So it, it seems to say here that the creation was done by God the Father. For they say, for you created all things, but now let's read more carefully the last part of the verse. And by your will, that is by the Father's will, they exist and were created. So notice, Somebody else is doing the active work of creation, and that person is implementing the Father's will. It says, by your will, by the Father's will, they exist and were created. Ellen White, who is always in harmony with Scripture, amplifies this point. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. The Son of God had wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven. And to Him, as well as to God, their homage and allegiance were due. Christ was still to exercise divine power 
in the creation of the earth and its inhabitants. But in all this he would not seek power or exaltation for himself, contrary to God's plan, that is the Father's plan, but would exalt the Father's glory and execute His purposes of beneficence and love. So clearly Ellen White explains that the Son of God wrought the Father's will in the creation of the heaven, heavenly hosts, and also He executed the purposes of the Father in the creation of this world. Now let's move to something which has puzzled many people, including scholars. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verses 3 through 5. Let's talk about the origin of the light. It says there in Genesis chapter 1 verses 3 to 5, Then God said, this is the first day of creation, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. So the evening and morning were the first day. Now we need to ask some incisive questions in the light of these verses. Where did the light come from on the first day? Some people say, well, God was the light on the first day. Well, that's not what the text actually says. When we read the text carefully, we're going to discover something very interesting. So the first question is, where did the light come from on the first day? Second question, what is it that divides the light from the darkness on this planet? Question number three, how could light and darkness exist on the first three days if the sun did not come into existence until the fourth day? Time and again people ask me this question, how could light and darkness exist on the first three days if the sun did not exist until the fourth day? And the final question is, could there be an evening and morning of the first three days if there was no sunrise or sunset during those first three days? Now the Bible makes it clear that the word evening refers to the setting of the sun. I'm going to read now one text from the Old Testament and another text from the New Testament that clearly show that in the Bible evening refers to the setting of the light of the sun. The first text is in Joshua 8 verse 29. We could read many other verses, but because of time we are only able to read one from the Old Testament and one from the New. Joshua 8:29. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise over it a great, great heap of stones that remains to this day. So notice, they hanged the king of Ai on a tree until the evening, and as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take him down. Clearly, evening is when the sun sets. Let's read now a statement from the New Testament. Mark chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. Mark 1, 32 and 33. You know, Jesus many times did not perform miracles on the Sabbath day to not overly um, aggravate the religious leaders. Sometimes he did heal on Sabbath to make a point, but many times he waited until sundown not to cause a conflict. So it says in Mark 1, 32 and 33, At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. So notice, at evening, when the sun had set. So evening is when the sun sets according to Scripture. Ellen White has a very incisive comment to make with this regard. In the book Christ Triumphant, page 18, which is a devotional book where you have a compilation of Ellen White's statements, she wrote this, When the Lord declares that He made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, 
He means the day of 24 hours which he has marked off by the rising and setting of the sun. Now in the light of these verses and the comment by the, the Lord's servant, we can reach several conclusions. First of all, all seven days were of equal length, 24 hours. Ellen White makes that clear. Second, all seven days had an evening and a morning. Third, evening and morning are marked off by the rising and setting of the sun. And finally, therefore the sun existed before the fourth day. I hope you're catching my point. Now I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, wait a minute. The Bible says that God created the sun the fourth day. Well, the Bible doesn't say that God created the sun the fourth day. There are two important words in Hebrew. One is bara. Before I uh, tell you the other word, I would like to say that the word bara, which is used in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created, the word created, the heavens and the earth. The word bara, God is always the subject. In other words, God is always bara. Man never barats. It is an exclusive act of God in the Hebrew Bible. There's another word which we're going to take a look at, the word asa, which is used for man doing certain things. Now let me read you a statement from Ministry of Healings, page 414 and 415. When God created this globe, He did not use pre-existing matter. God spoke and the planet came into existence. Notice this remarkable statement. In the creation of the earth, God was not indebted to pre-existing matter. He spoke and it was. He commanded and it stood fast. Psalm 33 and verse 9. All things, material or spiritual, stood up before the Lord Jehovah at His voice and were created for His own purpose. The heavens and all the host of them, the earth and all things therein came into existence by the breath of His mouth. Powerful statement. It's referred to as creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. God made something out of nothing. That's the meaning of the word bara that is used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, by the way, this word is also used in verse 27 where it speaks about the creation of man. It's used in Isaiah 40 verse 28, once again referring to creation at the beginning. It's used in Psalm 51 verse 10 where David is asking God to create in him a new heart. And it's used in Isaiah 65 verse 7 when God creates a new heavens and a new earth. But there's another word, the word asa. This word in Genesis and elsewhere in the Old Testament refers to something that takes place using matter they existed before. See, God created matter, and after creating matter, then God made certain things. The word is used uh, sometimes to refer to taking things that exist and ordering them or organizing them. I want you to notice, for example, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. A very interesting verse. It uses bara and it also uses asa. That's the significant point. Notice Genesis 5 and verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, the word bara, in the day that God created man, now comes asa, he made him in the likeness of God. So God spoke the matter into existence and then God used that matter according to Genesis chapter, uh, chapter uh, 2 and verses 15 to 17, God, uh, verse 7, excuse me, God then used that matter that He created out of nothing to form man from the matter that He had made. This text tells us that God both created and made man. God created the dust ex nihilo, that is, out of nothing, and then took the dust and formed man out of it. Organized the dust, if you please. Put it all together. 
According to Isaiah 64 and verse 8, God made or formed Israel from pre-existent clay. He took the clay, symbolically speaking of course, and God organized the clay or formed the clay, which is a symbol or a metaphor for Israel. Incidentally, the word is also used in Genesis 3 verse 7, where animal skins are taken to cover the nakedness of man. It's also used where God ta makes skins and covers the nakedness of Adam and Eve, and them also using fig leaves to cover their nakedness. Now, we need to ask some very incisive questions about how there could be light on the first day when God did not make the sun until the fourth day. So let's go and examine what the Bible has to say about the fourth day. Genesis chapter 1 and verses 14 through 19. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Wait a minute, I thought that that happened the first day, if you read the description in Genesis. Anyway, then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide day from night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. Now wait a minute, didn't God create light on the earth the first day? Let's continue. And it was so. Verse 16, Then God made, that's the word Asa, doesn't say He created the heavenly bodies, it said Asa. So, then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, He made the stars also. Verse 17, And God set them, that is the sun and the moon, set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light. Now wait a minute, didn't that happen uh, in the first day? To give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. Isn't that what uh, we find about the first day? Sounds a little bit confusing. And it says, And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Clearly the sun and the moon existed the first day. But on the fourth day, God synchronizes or organizes our solar system and places the sun and the moon in relationship to all of the other heavenly bodies. So we've talked about creation. Now let's talk about decreation. You see, you, you, you say, decreation? Decreation of what? Decreation of the heavens and earth. You see, the Bible tells us that this earth and the heavens will go through a process of decreation. You say, really? Let's read Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 1 and verse 3. Isaiah 24, 1 and 3. This is speaking about events relating to the second coming. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. Key word, empty, void, and makes it waste that is in a disorderly state, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. The land shall be entirely emptied, there's the word again, emptied and utterly plundered for the Lord has spoken this word. In other words, what is going to happen as a result of the plagues and the second coming is a process of decreation a return to the condition the earth was in before God in six days set the planet in order and filled it and gave light and created life. Let's go through what God is going to do. You see, at the second coming of Jesus, actually before, during the fifth plague, darkness will be over the earth. This is the reason why during the millennium this planet will be in darkness. We're going to notice that. What about the second day, the firmament? Well, the firmament is going to be poisoned with fire and brimstone, and the stench of the dead that will not be buried, according to Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 30 through 38. You know, in Fresno last summer, we had terrible air quality because of fires that took place 
in uh, the forests here in near Fresno. In fact, the year before, the Creek Fire kept us at home for many, many days because of the terrible air quality. Now imagine fire and brimstone all over the earth plus dead bodies all over the earth. The firmament will become poisoned and vile. What about the vegetation? The fourth plague will destroy all of the vegetation according to Revelation chapter 16 verses 8 and 9. What is going to happen with the sun, moon, and stars? We're going to see that the sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their places. They will not be able to benefit planet earth during the millennium and that's the reason why this earth will be in darkness during the millennium. The Bible tells us in Revelation 16 verse 3 that all of the marine animals will die. We're told in Jeremiah 4.25 that all of the birds of the air are gone. The earth creatures all dead. All human beings also dead according to Jeremiah chapter 25 verses 30 to 38 and according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5 where it says the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were ended. And then of course there's not going to be any Sabbath on this earth during the thousand years. You say why not? Well, because the sun, moon, and stars have been moved out of their places. So what has happened as a result of the events relating to the second coming? The planet has returned to the condition it was in before God's work during the sixth and seventh day of creation week. You say, where do you get this from? Well, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4 and verses 23 to 28. Jeremiah chapter 4 verses 23 through 28. Here Jeremiah is given a vision of the earth as a result of the plagues in the second coming. Notice what it says. Jeremiah uh, writes, I beheld the earth and indeed it was without form and void. Where do we find that same expression? Genesis. So is the world going to return to the condition it was in before what God did to organize an order at creation week? Absolutely. I beheld the earth and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains and indeed they trembled. And all the hills moved back and forth because the second coming of Jesus will uh, see a tremendous earthquake, actually events slightly before the second coming. Verse 25, I beheld and indeed there was no man, no living person, and all the birds of the heavens had fled, no birds. Verse 26, I beheld and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by His fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end because the second coming is not the full end. The full end is after the millennium. Notice verse 28, for this shall the earth mourn, and here comes the key point, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken, I have purposed, and will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. So it says the heavens will be black. So notice once again, darkness on the planet instead of light. The firmament defiled, the vegetation all burned up, sun, moon, and stars moved out of their places. That's why the planet is in darkness. All of the marine animals, dead. All of the birds, dead. All of the earth creatures, dead. All human beings, dead. And no Sabbath because the sun and the moon have been moved out of their places like they were before creation week. See, God took them at creation week and placed them where they would benefit the earth with a cycle of day and night. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and verses 29 to 31 where this idea of darkness is picked up. This same idea that Jeremiah mentions is picked up. Matthew ch chapter 24 has all of the sequence of events that lead up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The, Bi the Bible speaks there in Matthew 24 and verse 21 of a great tribulation. That's a time of trouble such as never has been seen. And let's pick it up where uh, the events that take place after the great tribulation occur. Matthew 24 
beginning with verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, in other words, immediately after the great time of trouble, notice what's going to happen. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. So notice, sun darkened, moon not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, because the heavens are going to be rolled up like, like a scroll according to Revelation chapter 6, and it says the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then verse 30 says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Notice that this darkness takes place immediately before the second coming. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then, once Jesus is above the earth, not on the earth, but above the earth, we are told, and He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now what is meant by the expression, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. What are the powers of the heavens? Well, the text tells us. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Sun and moon are going to be shaken. Now, the powers of the heavens, in other words, what is meant by that powers of the heavens? Well, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 16. Genesis 1 verse 16. You see the sun and moon rule in the heavens. It says there, then God made two great lights, the greater light, that is the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. So what are the powers that rule in the heavens? The power that rule in the heavens are the sun and the moon. And notice that Matthew 24 says that they are going to be darkened. And this is the reason why during the millennium the planet is in darkness like it was before God be began the process of creation that is described there in Genesis chapter 1. Ellen White had some additional points actually where she amplifies what Matthew 24 is referring to and what Genesis 1 verse 16 also describes. In early writings, page 41, Ellen White wrote, December 4, 16, 1848, the Lord gave me a view, that means a vision, of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. So she's now going to comment about the shaking of the powers in the heavens. We just read it in Matthew 24. She continues, I saw that when the Lord said heaven, in giving the signs recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we only read from Matthew chapter 24, but Mark and Luke repeat the same idea, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. So once again, uh, she says, I saw that when God said, the Lord said heaven, in giving the signs recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, He meant heaven. And when He said earth, He meant earth. Now comes the explanation. The powers of earth are those that rule on the earth. In other words, the civil rulers. Now notice what she continues saying. Actually, let me go back a little bit. The powers of the heavens are the sun, moon, and stars. They rule in the heavens. Now, she says, the powers of earth are those that rule on the earth. The powers of heaven, listen carefully, will be shaken at the voice of God. Then sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their places. They will not pass away, but be shaken by the voice of God. In other words, they will go out of their orbits. They will who knows where they will go as a result of the voice of God. But the planet will no longer have light because the sun, moon, and stars have been moved out of their places. So she says, then the sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their places. They will not pass away, but be shaken by the voice of God. So this is a really, really powerful statement. Powers of the heavens are heaven, the powers of earth are the earth. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referring to this. Then she says that they're called the powers of heaven because they rule in the heavens. 
The powers of the earth are the civil rulers on the earth. And when the plagues take place, primarily the fifth plague and the second coming, the powers of heaven will be shaken and the sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of other places. They will not pass away, but be shaken by the voice of God. I hope you're catching the picture. What about the shaking of the powers of the earth? Well, the shaking of the powers of the earth takes place before this. In fact, Ellen White describes that the shaking of the powers of the earth is taking place in her day, and we would say much more today. She ends the statement in early writings, page 41, by describing the powers of the earth, the shaking of the powers of the earth, the civil rulers, the governments of the earth. This is what she wrote. I saw that the powers of earth are now, when she's writing, are now being shaken, and that events come in order. And then she refers to Matthew 24 and verses 6 and 7. See, she's going back in Matthew chapter 24, because the nations of the earth are shaken before the shaking of the powers in the heavens. She writes, war and rumors of war, sword, famine, and pestilence, all mentioned in chapter 6 and uh, chapter 24, 6 and 7, are first to shake the powers of earth. Then the voice of God will shake the sun, moon, and stars, and this earth also. Ellen White is referring to Matthew 24, 6 and 7, where it says, And you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Notice Ellen White is simply uh, commenting on Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7 that take place during probationary time, when she talks about the powers of the heavens being shaken, the sun, moon, and stars, she's referring to events that take place during the fifth plague, right before the second coming of Christ. Now some people say, but wait a minute, Pastor, the signs in the sun, moon, and stars took place in the past, in the year 1780 and in 1833, and the great earthquake was in 1755. So how can you say that in Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, it's talking about signs that take place uh, at the end of the plagues and at the second coming of Christ? Well, the fact is that we need to study Scripture carefully. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6, 12, and 13. You see, there are signs in the sun, moon, and stars and an earthquake that takes place to announce the soon coming of Christ but those signs in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29 are the signs that take place when Jesus comes. In other words, the same heavenly bodies are affected, but they are two different sets of signs. You say, how do we know that? Revelation 6, 12 and 13 refers to what happened 1780 and uh, 1755, a little bit earlier, and 1833. I looked when he opened the sixth seal. And behold, there was a great earthquake, that's the Lisbon earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. That's what happened during the day in 1780, in May of 1780. And now notice this detail. And the moon became like blood. It doesn't say that the moon is darkened. The moon became like blood. And it says, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. As a fig tree drops its late figs, when it is shaken by a mighty wind. So notice it doesn't say the, that the moon is dark, and it says that the moon is seen as blood. And by the way, the stars do not cease to give their light. Clearly, the stars were brighter in 1833. Now, let's go to Joel chapter 2 and verse 31, where the language of Revelation 6, 12, and 13 comes from. Joel 2 and verse 31 gives us a very interesting detail. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood, now listen carefully, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. This does not take place in the contents of the second coming. It takes place before the moon is not darkened. The moon is turned into a color that looks like blood. There are, however, other passages of Scripture 
where we find what will take place that is described in Matthew 24 and verse 29. Same heavenly bodies, but the heavenly bodies are uh, uh, affected in a different way. Partially in 1780 and 1833, fully during the plagues and at the second coming. Let's read Joel chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. The context indicates that this is talking about the second coming of Christ. The earth quakes before them. Notice here, you have the earthquake. The heavens tremble. In other words, they're shaken. The sun and moon grow dark, not turned into blood, the moon. They grow dark. And the stars diminish their brightness. That cannot be said about 1833 because the falling of the stars, they were very bright in the heavens. Verse 11, the Lord gives voice before His army. This is Jesus coming in Revelation chapter 19 with the armies of heaven. So once again, the Lord gives voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes His word. And this question reappears in Revelation 6 verse 17. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Let's notice also Joel chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Joel 3, 15 and 16. Once again, these are not the signs that take place in the past, signs of the soon coming of Jesus. These signs take place in the context of the fifth, fifth sixth, and seventh plagues and the second coming of Christ. Joel 3, 15 and 16. The sun and moon will grow dark. Notice it doesn't say that the moon is going to be turned to a color like blood. The sun and moon will grow dark, and the sun and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake. That did not happen, folks, in 1755. The heavens did not shake. But here it says the heavens and the earth will shake but the Lord will be a shelter for His people and the strength of the children of Israel. Another passage which has been misinterpreted as applying to the signs that took place in 1780, 1833, and also the earthquake of 1755 is Isaiah chapter 13, verses 10 to 13. Let's read it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wickedness for their sin, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty, and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. And then comes the earthquake. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord God Almighty in the day of His burning anger. So what have we noticed so far? Creation. We've studied also about decreation. Now let's talk about re-creation. After the destruction of the wicked that takes place after the millennium, God will do once again what He did at the very beginning. He's going to put the planet in order. He's going to fill the planet. He's going to enlighten the planet. And He is going to place life on the planet. Now, how long do you suppose God is going to, uh, how long is God going to work to recreate this world? Well, He's going to use the same number of days as He did at the beginning. You say, how do we know that? Well, we're going to notice in a few moments that very clearly we are going to keep the Sabbath to commemorate the new creation, and you cannot have a seventh day Sabbath unless God has used the first, first six days to recreate this earth and return it to the condition that it was at the beginning. The beautiful thing is that at, when God recreates a heaven, the heavens and the earth, the redeemed will be alive. You see, at the beginning, none of God's people were alive. Adam and Eve did not see God create anything. They had to accept by faith that God was the Creator. But at the end of time, when God says, let there be light, let there be the firmament, let the earth produce vegetation, may the sun, moon, and stars occupy their places as when I did that at the beginning. 
May the, the air have birds in them. May the waters produce marine creatures. May the land produce land creatures. God's people will be eyewitness, witnesses. They will be there present, seeing what God is doing. We will no longer walk by faith. We will walk by sight. By the way, do you notice that creation, redemption, and the recreation all are related to the expression finish? You say, really? Well, you remember that at creation, we're told in Genesis chapter 1, if you go with me there for, for a moment, Genesis chapter 1, and let's read verse 31, and then chapter 2 and verse 1, which really should go with ch the chapter 1. It says, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. What about when Jesus finished his works of redemption? What did he say on the cross? He said, it is finished. Do you know that the word finished is also used in conjunction with the new creation at the end of time? And the Sabbath is the sign all the way through. You say, how is that? Go with me to Revelation chapter 21 and verses 3 to 7. Revelation 21, 3 through 7. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Notice, the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. That's the recreation, folks. And now notice what it continues saying. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, What? It is done. So he says, I will make all things new. And then after he makes all things new, he says, It is done. And do you know what is going to commemorate the creation, redemption, and the recreation? The Sabbath. At the beginning, God made the Sabbath after he finished his work the sixth day. When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, finished the provision for salvation, he said it is finished. And at the end, when God makes the new heavens and the new earth, he's going to say it is finished, and the Sabbath will be the sign just as Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 66 and verses 22 and 23. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23, where we are told that we will go to worship before the Lord every month and every week. It says, therefore, as the new heavens and new earth, no doubt about what this is referring to, it's recreation. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, some people get hung up on that, new moon sim simply means the month, from every month to month, because the new moon began each month. So it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, literally in Hebrew it says, from one new moon to another new moon, and from one Sabbath to another, literally from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh, not only the Jews, folks, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. How interesting. All flesh will come to worship on the Sabbath when God finishes his work of a new creation. The Sabbath will become the sign of the new creation. Just like the Sabbath was the sign that Jesus had finished his redemptive works, he rested in the tomb. Just like after six days of work, Jesus rested from his works of creation at the very beginning. Now John Paul II, in his pastoral letter, Dies Domini, affirmed that in the future city, the New Jerusalem, we will live an eternal Sunday. This is what paragraph 84 of his... Um, pastoral letter says, from Sunday to Sunday, enlightened by Christ, she, that is the church, goes forward towards the unending Sunday of the heavenly Jerusalem, 
which has no need of the sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. If you read this carefully, what he's saying is that in the city there's not going to be any sun or moon. Now the question is, how can there be months and days if there is no sun and if there is no moon? Is it true that God's people will live in an unending Sunday in the future? Let's read carefully the verse that he quoted. He actually quoted Revelation 21, 23. Has no need of the sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23. Let's read it carefully. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. Does it say the whole earth had no sun or moon? No, the city. Does it say that there was no sun or moon? No, it says that, they, that in the city there was no need of sun or moon. Why? Here's the explanation. For the glory of God illuminated it. The lamp is its light. The text does not say that there's not going to be any sun or moon. It says that the sun or moon will not be needed in the city because God's glory is so much greater. Isaiah 24 verse 23 expressed it in a different way. I like this. The moon, then the moon will be disgraced, and the sun ashamed, for, that means because, the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before His elders gloriously. Beautiful. What does that mean? The moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed. It simply means that in the city, even though the sun and moon are shining, the light won't be seen. It's kind of like me turning on a flashlight when the sun is beating down at noon. The flashlight is on, but the glory of the sun eclipses the glory of the flashlight. By the way, there will be months there. Very clearly, Revelation 22 and verse 2 says, In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So God's people will go monthly to eat from the tree of life and worship the Lord, and they will go weekly on the Sabbath to worship the Lord, because it is the reminder of the new creation, as well as redemption, as well as the original creation. Now all of this might appear to be academic, so let me end on a practical tone. Folks, there's nothing in this world that is going to remain as a result of the plagues and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The important thing for us is to commit our lives to Jesus Christ so that when these events take place, when the decreation takes place, we are on the Lord's side. That's the important point. Now what is life going to be like after uh, the millennium? I want to read in ending the passage that we find in Isaiah 35 verses 3 through 10. You tell me if this is the kind of world that you want to live in. And if we want to live in that world, folks, we're going to have to commit our lives to Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. If we plan to live, him, live with Him throughout eternity, we need to learn to live with Him now by committing our life fully and completely to Him. Isaiah 35, verse 3. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble, feeble knees. This is quoted in Hebrews chapter 12. Say to those who are feel, fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Why don't we fear? Ah, behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf, deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Oh, California, there will be no more droughts. Verse 7, the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and a road and it shall be called the highway of holiness. 
The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. No more COVID, no more deaths, no more suffering, no more economic problems, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more deaths. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. Let's commit our lives to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord now. Let's not allow anything to stand between Jesus and us so that when this takes place, we will say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him and He will save us. May that be the desire, the intense desire of our hearts is my prayer. Come make a joyful noise with us singing hymn number 44, Morning Has Broken. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we have studied about creation, decreation, and recreation, we ask, Lord, that you will recreate a new heart within us so that when you recreate this universe, we might be able to enjoy fellowship in your presence for the ages without end. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of the soon coming of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to take the necessary steps to be ready. And we thank you for answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 